hands out to him and, and welcome him, will you? And just tell him, oh, Holy Spirit, you're the reason we're here. <clears throat> We've come to meet with you. We've come to encounter Jesus. We've come to have a further, deeper revelation of the Father's love. And we realize all over again that we are at our best when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. So Lord, I ask that you would come and touch hearts and touch lives and help us to get our lives in context with what you're doing all over the earth right now because it feels like something massive is about to blow wide open. And we ask you for it. We ask you for more. We ask you to increase our portion and make us even more effective in impacting the world for Jesus Christ and bringing the kingdom of God for your sake. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I'd love it if all of you went out of this conference this week just absolutely armed and dangerous. <clears throat> Wouldn't that be amazing? We had our 25th anniversary last Jan January the, the 20th in and about, and uh, it, it was just, it was a fantastic time. And when you think of 25 years gone by, and it's still just raging and cooking and burning away. I mean, that's an, that's an amazing thing in itself, isn't it? And people ask me, well, why? How is it going so long and everything else? And I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just, we just like it, and uh, he likes that we like it, I guess. That's a... <laughs> but see, Young E. Cho said many years ago that revival is never supposed to end. Yeah. And uh, that was a new thought for me uh, when I first read that. And because all of my, you know, more or less casual studies of revival at that time, where they, they go for a year and a half or they go for three years maybe, but they always ended up stopping yeah. for one reason or another and nobody was sure why. And uh, I remember when we were, were overwhelmed with it in 94, not knowing, what is this, like the end of the world, the coming of Jesus, like what's going on? Um, I had the Lord speak to me and say, this is a revival that will never end. And <clears throat> I'm not trying to sound presumptuous with that, but what, what he meant was it'll just keep spreading out and spreading out, and, and the flame of it is going to be burning somewhere uh, until Jesus comes. And I want you to catch that flame and keep it burning in your heart, because it's not ever supposed to go out. You know, I, every now and then we go to a meeting and uh, I just feel from the Lord not to prepare anything, just turn up and see what happens. And this, this is one of those nights. <laughs> so it, it's always a bit like walking on the water, you know, because we don't want to come all this way and, and, and just totally strike out, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but I already know that that won't happen because I felt that intense presence coming on my hands during that amazing worship, like I said. And uh, if you will hunger and thirst after righteousness, the promise is that you will be filled. And I want you to know you're absolutely at your best when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, 
I want to tell you our story, but it might be a little bit random as we dip in and out of the sequence, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that when things go on and on and on for year after year to the point where now this is 25 years of this, the question I ask myself and, and even others is, how do you stay appropriately excited about this after all this time. You remember how excited you were on, on your wedding day? Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I remember that. Like Carol and I have been married 40 years as of May 9. And uh, and uh, I, I, I really remember how excited I was to be taking her as my wife and living together and just being together and all of that. It was such a big deal. But you know what? You, you can kind of get used to it after a while. Not that we ever have, uh, but you need to work at it so that that doesn't happen. And I want to say that to you about the Holy Spirit, because actually there's a courtship going on, and hopefully you're being prepared by the Holy Spirit to be the, the bride of Christ. And I don't want that to ever get old for you. I want you to fall deeper and deeper in love with him, where it's more and more fresh and more and more exciting, so that... It grows, and it doesn't diminish. Does that make sense? Now, when you get highlights in the anointing, it's, it's, it's something you look back to with fond memories. And I want you to know that in, in the years 94, 95, 96, 97, I mean, most of the 90s, we were in a raging revival. And um, it didn't matter who the speaker was. Um, it didn't matter who, who prayed for you, who the ministry team was. You just seemed to walk in the zone. And if you're open even a little bit, you're going to get clobbered by the Holy Spirit. And um, it was so powerful, it was shocking to people. And it had a prophetic spinning off on it that people didn't understand. Why is that guy roaring? And why is, why is this happening? And, and it, was, it was so much new stuff. Our theology was desperately trying to keep up with what God was doing. And we look back on that as absolutely the highlight of our life. But you know... There's even better days yet to come. And the grand finale is when Jesus returns for you. I'm standing over there because I can't see you if I stand in the light. You know? Can you rev up your engines and get even more excited about that which is about to come and fall upon you? In Jesus' name. There's so much that we would want to bring in, but what our values are is, is a, uh, a revelation of the Father's love for you so that you know, and there's a takeaway, where you know that you know that he loves you just the way you are. However, he loves you too much to leave you the way you are. So he's going to call you to go from glory to glory to glory. But it's in the context of a loving father who absolutely loves you. It's amazing how many people don't know that. And so we go all over the world telling people that God loves them, number one. And uh, I think it's the primary problem that we're trying to address, actually, 
because we live in a fatherless and now motherless generation. And there's so much dysfunction in homes where dads don't know how to be dads anymore and moms don't know how to be moms. And, and, and so it's just this do the best you can, kids, kind of a thing. And um, what that does is it leaves, a, it leaves a faulty idea about what fatherhood and, and loving fatherhood is all about. I see it as the primary problem in all the world. That's what Carol and I learned in the 80s. A dear man by the name of Jack Winter came. And, uh, you know, we were just very quickly, uh, Carol and I got married. We went to, we were, I had a business. I trained for the ministry, but because of being divorced and now remarried and everything, I felt disqualified in those days. I had a dear pastor friend whose name is Alec Ness. He asked me one day, whatever happened to your love for souls? I said, well, I absolutely still have that. He said, then you need to get into the ministry. I said, how can I? I'm divorced and remarried, and so is my wife. Now, my circumstances were interesting. God knew my heart. I wasn't in, under any guilt or shame about it, but it was just a fact. And he said, John, half this country is divorced. Go minister to that half. So I said, okay, and if that includes you tonight, uh, you're welcome here because God is in the recycling business, <laughs> and he knows how to make you brand new, whether it was your fault or not. Some people are the victim of it all, and uh, he knows how to, how to rework that for you. But anyway, we, uh, we, I, had, I had been to Ontario Bible College, now Tyndale, for three years, but never gone into ministry because of all that stuff. And uh, Carol and I took a trip to Indonesia the year after we were married, 1980. We went there, and we wanted to see the revival that was going on. And it was raging, I'm telling you. It was really, really going there. We went meetings morning, noon, and night, little house meetings, church meetings, this meeting, that meeting. And, and uh, then we went to the far part, like it was, it's now called Papua, West East, yeah, West Papua. And uh, they wrecked us with their love, all right? We came home on the airplane in tears, and we said, God will do anything for you. Have you ever said that to him? I'm not sure you should let him hear you say that. <laughs> we'll do anything for you. We'll go anywhere for you. Just give us something to do. And he said to me, good, I want you to go to Carol's hometown and start a church, a charismatic church. And I was like, oh, Lord, not there. <laughs> Hawaii, maybe. Uh, well, Red Deer, maybe. Yes, this is a nice place. But anyway, we went there, and we, and we started out. And that's Carol's hometown, so we had to live it all down as well, see. You had to face the, the, the shame or the talk. What? Carol's back with her new husband? They started a what? And you know what? God began to visit us a little bit. And I had YWAM friends say, you guys need to have Jack Winter come. Okay, who is he? Well, he, he's, a, he's an international itinerant speaker, and he talks about the father heart of God. I said, the what? You know, the father heart of God. No, I don't know. What are you talking about? Well, the fact that God is, is love. He said, oh, okay, I got that. So I knew the, the theology of the love of God. But uh, I didn't know God was a loving father. 
because my stereotype of him was watch your step boy or you, or you're going to get it and uh jack came to us and unpacked my favorite chapter of John chapter 14 where he said, let, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, here's a good line, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Wow, there's a message we don't hear much in many charismatic churches. Tell the person next to you, Jesus is coming soon, by the way. <laughs> that where I am, there you may be also. And then he says, where I go, you know. And the way you know. And Thomas goes, time out, wait a minute. We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? That's a fair question, isn't it? And he said, well, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. And Jack stopped right there. And he said, so, where is it that we're going? I said, we're going to heaven, Jack. He said, okay. Someone else said, we're going to eternity. We're going into eternal life. All right? But maybe we should read it again. No one comes unto the Father except through me. He says, we're going to the Father. And do you know I had a brief moment there where that, I didn't want to do that. Are you kidding? We're going to the Father? You mean the one who's going to put us under a microscope and show us a thousand things that are still wrong with us? I don't want to do that. Do you? Do you? I mean, I was happy to go to heaven and, and be with Jesus and be with all you guys and be with Peter and Paul and John and Abraham and Isaac and everybody. But you see that bright light way over there in the distance? That's the Father. You want to stay away from that if you can. And there I find out, you know, that this is, this is our destination. And I, I had that moment where that's not where I wanted to go. And Jack kept unpacking that portion to us where he goes on with what Jesus is saying about um, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Let me find it and I'll read it to you. Because I see this as the fundamental problem with the human race. We're disconnected from the family of God through fear and misunderstanding and things like that. If you, well, let me keep reading it. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on you see him and know him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and it's sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, now, now he's surprised by this. It's kind of like, what? Have I been with you all this time? And yet, you do not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me, he does the works. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. 
Believe me for the sake of the miracles. And the, the, the penny started to drop for me. They, I began to see what this was all about. Because I knew that Jesus said over and over, the, 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 the things that I do, these are not my things. This is not my works. This is the works of him who sent me. This is the Father working in me. And so this is the mystery of Christ, where he comes as a man, and the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, is working through him. But he's the one initiating all this stuff. So when Jesus heals the leper, uh, he's saying, it's not me doing it. It's the Father doing it through me. It's not me initiating this. It's the Father doing it through me. You want to know what the Father's like? He really loves lepers and wants to heal them. And finally, he's got a delivery system to bring heaven to earth. Jesus is here in the flesh. And so, boom, we can bring healing to this man. And I love that story from Mark chapter 1 where the, the leper comes to Jesus and says, if you're willing, you can make me whole. And what's he say? I am willing. Be made whole. But then he did something that I doubt that any of us here in this room would do. Do you know what it was? He touched him. Would you touch a leper? Would you? I mean, contagious disease. But see, Jesus knew that uh, the cleanness and anointing on him would overpower the uncleanness and the darkness and the contamination of that leprosy by the anointing. I don't, th I don't think it was a bare touch. I think it was a, probably a massive hug or something. This guy hadn't been touched in years. Think of it. When's the last time someone touched you and said, hey, good to meet you, or nice going? Or they told you they loved you. When's the last time you told your children you loved them? Tell them that when they're at their worst. <laughs> Just for fun. I love you, you little rascal. Smarten up and behave yourself. <laughs> no, but this is the heart of God that we began to see. We learned that through the 80s. And as we learned that, we learned a couple other things with it. We learned from Mark Berkler about hearing the voice of God. It became the fountain of all words of knowledge and, and prophetic flow. And Mark is another one that's, I mean, he's got such a major piece for the body of Christ, and it's frustrating that he's so unknown, really. How many here have heard of Mark Berkler? Good. Have you had him here? Yeah. And, uh, but he could tell you, he could teach you how to, you know, just get some props around you and learn to hear the voice of God. But the voice of God is not stern and condemning and harsh. After all, it's, it's gentle and it's winning and it's encouraging and it's calling us into life. And, and we learned all that. And then we learned from the Sanfords that he wants to heal that which is on the inside of us. Have you ever been brokenhearted? Anybody besides me? He's come to bind up the brokenhearted and heal the bruised and set the captives free. Wow. We learned all that in the 80s, just plugging away, practicing on all those poor people in Stratford, David. David here is with me, and he's the chairman of the board of that Stratford church that we, Carol and I, first started. So stand up and give him a wave, Dave, please. Yeah. And... Uh, when we started our church, all we really knew was Catherine Kuhlman 
and Benny Hinn, and a little bit about Bill Prankard. And, you know, Catherine Kuhlman was, I don't know, kind of rescued a bunch of us in a way, gave us hope, again, that the Bible was really true because of the signs and miracles and wonders that we saw. But there was more, though. There was more to it than that. Because, see, it seemed to me like that 90% of the preachers would, would, would sort of yell at you and point out, you know, come on, how come you're not doing better? You need to give more, pray more, attend more meetings, witness more, share more, do more. I mean, where were you Wednesday night? Anyway, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> there, there was just this sort of a barrage of condemnation that, that for me personally wasn't really helpful. But then Catherine Kuhlman, on the other hand, was like, always telling these little anecdotal stories about her father or her this or that, and this is what he's like. And in the middle of her little heart-to-heart -heart talk, she'd suddenly launch into specific words of knowledge. If somebody back here was just healed of this or that, somebody over here, this or that. And the next thing you know, they were, they, people were flooding to the front, healed of major diseases of one kind or another. And it was so refreshing, friends. And I remember all the way through Bible school, I'd set my car tape recorder to record her program that came on at, I don't know, 9 o'clock. I was school in the daytime and then a night shift till like 11 or whatever at night. And uh, I would get that 15-minute program because it was just so life-giving to me. And then out of that came uh, Benny Hinn and Bill Prankert, who went to her meeting. You know, have you heard Bill tell the story about his first trip to Catherine Kuhlman's? Yeah. It's hilarious, isn't it? And uh, anyway, he caught it, and so did Benny. And I knew, I knew Benny quite well and still do. In fact, he phoned me the other night and said, they're announcing you there in Red Deer. And, and uh, yeah, we're here, and we're going to have a good meeting, and da-da-da. And so we caught up. I've known him for like 40 years or whatever, more, more than that. I've known him longer than I've known Carol. <laughs> but anyway, that gave us hope that now this message of, of, of kindness and goodness and whatever was being backed up with signs and wonders in our day. Then we found out about the Vineyard Church. And it was similar with signs and wonders, but it believed in the plurality of uh, ministry leaders. So it wasn't just led from the front all the time with, a, with one person leading. I almost said superstar, but I, don't, I didn't want to use that word. Because um, Catherine herself was a one-person model. But now we're introduced to ministry teams, and oh boy, did that ever multiply things. And so Carol and I began mobilizing ministry teams in our Stratford church and in our Toronto church, where we did both of them for five years. And um, so we had probably at least 200 people who had gone through all this hard stuff that we'd learned. They learned about a revelation of the Father's love and an encounter with the Father's love by the Spirit. They learned about how to hear the voice of God. They learned a bit about getting their own hearts healed up. Do you know about the importance of forgiveness? That, that book I wrote back in 90. Eight, I think it was. There's just been, I don't know, so many hundreds of thousands of copies in so many languages. That book is in Russian and German and Korean and Chinese and English even and Spanish and on and on. 
but it's so life-changing because people don't know the, the, the devastation that you bring upon yourself by holding on to unforgiveness. <clears throat> Has there anybody here ever been hurt by another person? <laughs> Besides me, unashamedly, you can just wave your hand. Yes, that's me over here. I was a victim. That's true. But don't stay a victim, will you? Give that person a gift they do not deserve, just like Jesus gave you a gift you do not deserve. And get out from under that so that you can take your freedom and put the enemy away. So that's what we did through the 80s. But we came full circle uh, as we came into the 90s. We were in the process of moving from our Stratford home to Toronto. After doing both churches for five years, we felt we, it was time to make a decision. And I deeply disappointed the Stratford Church by moving to Toronto, which is my hometown. But in a few years, it became apparent as to why the Lord led us that way. But um, we went to a Benny Hinn meeting downtown Toronto in the summer of 1992. And he filled Maple Leaf Gardens, which held about 18,000 or whatever. And uh, we saw the lame walk and the blind see and the deaf hear. And it was a powerful night. About 1,000 people came to Christ. And we were saying, God, we have to have this. We have to have this. And it wasn't as though we forgot about the Holy Spirit and the anointing, but you know, as you're learning new things, it's hard to keep all the balls in the air and all the plates spinning, isn't it? And so, yes, Holy Spirit, we really value and want you. You were the secret of our churches growing anyway, and, and, and we just reconnected in a special way. So he says to me, uh, come on back into the green room. And uh, so I've got Carol and myself and Mark DuPont's wife, Kim, and the three of us go through the door. Now, normally in the green room, Benny's kind of over it, and he's kicked back, and he's having a Coke, and he's joking around and laughing. But not that night. He is still really under the anointing. And as we came through the door, he lunged at us, and he's like, the Spirit of God is on you, boom, and we're all down on the floor. <laughs> and Carol got blasted. I'm lying there thinking, is there, a, is there a measure of reality here? Did he push me over? Like, what, what just happened? You know, just going into analysis mode. Anybody here do that? <laughs> Anybody here ever been pushed over? Was it helpful? No. And, and so um, he's saying to me, pick up your wife. I'm like, there's no way. She's just out like a noodle. I can't move her. Okay, leave her. So she's there about for half an hour, and we finally got Carol up, and, and she's just buzzing all over. And I'm saying to her, baby, stay under this. This is what we want. Don't try and get it together. I'll get you home. Forget about dinner. Forget about everything. Just take it, you know. And, um, and so she really, really, really got it. I'd had to almost carry her to the car, Kim and I did, got her in, took her home, and got her in bed. And she just buzzed all night with the anointing on her. Now, I want you to connect with this, because this is, this is not imagination, friends. This is not hype or mind over matter. What we're talking about is an invasion of the Holy Spirit coming down on a person and plugging you in to high voltage of heaven, okay? And she's just... And uh, she's like that for most of the night. 
So we said, God, we have to have this. Anybody here want that? Tell him, I have to have this. Well, here's what he said. He said, John, if you want this, I'll give you two things to do. Number one, I want your mornings. Number two, I want you to hang around with those that carry the anointing. Now, I understood perfectly what he meant by number one. I want your mornings. And I said, you want my mornings, like my whole morning? Like, how is this going to work? We're a new church. We're just getting going here. I want your mornings. So I talked it over with Jeremy and his wife, and, 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 and we're like, okay, let's do this. Well, see, it, it took us a month or more to get in the groove. But after a while, three, four hours in his presence goes like that. Not at first, but after a while. And it was the glorious, most glorious time because we fell back in love with Jesus again during that time. So what did you do? Well, we, we would worship together. We would read the word together. We would pray the word on our knees. We would read devotional books. I don't know, Andrew Murray, Benny Hinn's book on Good Morning, Holy Spirit, devotional books, and then we'd sing some more, read some more, pray some more, all that kind of thing. We just hung out with him. And the Lord spoke many, many precious things to me during that time. And I'll never forget this one. I've told this one around the world because it just so hit me. <clears throat> but I was weeping before him and saying, God, I'm so sorry for coming to you with like, like this prayer list of things that we need. You know, we need a new car. We need the mortgages coming up. We need this. We need that. We need the other. We need, we need, we need, we need. The people need, you know, our shopping list. And I'm like, God, I'm just so sorry. I, I don't want uh, that to be my prayer life. I, I just want to be with you. I want to fall in love with you. I want to hang out with you. I want to connect heart to heart with you. And I'm telling him all that. And he says this to me. He said, John, many of my people want to marry me for my money. And that went into me like a sword. And I said, oh, dear God, I don't want to marry you for your money. It's you that I really want. It really, really, really is you. And so we, we drew closer and closer in that time. You see what's going on? The other part of hanging out around with those that are anointed, I didn't understand so well. I thought I did. I thought it just meant, well, watch them see what they do, study their model, kind of learn their ways and, and this and that, and learn from them. I mean, really, it would have been amazing if we had a videotape of Jesus ministering, wouldn't it? And we could see, look, at that's, that's how you do it right there. But we don't have that. And so hang around them. I didn't at the time realize he was talking about impartation. I thought he was talking about observation, but no, no, this was really about impartation. So we heard of the revival in Argentina, and we planned to go on a tour that Ed Silvosa was taking along with Peter Wagner, and they were going to the revival in Argentina, and I wanted to go. I wanted to go see it. And uh, it wasn't really all that practical. It was a heck of a lot of money. And there were other things around it. And, uh, and, but anyway, someone sewed into us. Our, our daughter, Lori, said, here, I, I, I just feel to give you $500 towards it. And, and that kind of tipped it, you know. And we said, all right, well, sweetie, you know, you can't afford it either. But anyway, all right, we'll go. And we went. And uh, it was great. We went to... Oh, almost prison where revival there had taken over a maximum security prison and all these prisoners 
on the, the top floor and half the floor under that. I mean, they were, they were just on fire for God. We walked in that prison, and they're singing, I'm free, I'm free, in Spanish, you know. And it, it was just like, oh, my gosh, they've taken a maximum security prison for Jesus. <laughs> and uh, I'm thinking, we can't even take a high school. And so it was... It was we, we visited Carlos Anacondia, and it was amazing, people getting gold teeth there and stuff. And, and so when we finally had this one night where they decided last minute they're going to go to Claudio Friesen, or at least have him come and speak to the group. And I was really keen to hear him because I'd seen him at a Benny Hinn meeting, and I knew this, the back story, how he been prayed for by Benny and so on. So that was a connect point for me. Isn't it amazing how the Lord connects all this? And this, this group here is connected to all this stuff, you know, like Claudio, Benny, that's in, in Toronto. I mean, amazing. Anyway, um, Claudio called up all the Westerners. And, uh, of course, Carol and I go up. Peter Wagner went up and he's blasted. Cindy Jacobs went up. She's blasted out on the carpet. And Carol goes up. She's absolutely fried. I think her shoes went one way and she went the other. <laughs> and um, you know, Carol's like that or used to be like that um, where if, if you got anywhere close to her and said Holy Spirit She'd be on the floor. <laughs> and now she's not like that. She, she can stand in the anointing. But anyway, she got wrecked. And then he prayed for me. And, you know, Claudio is not uh, a feather touch, generally. He's, he's, he's like, and I remember something like, where you go? And boom. And, and I'm on the floor. And again, I'm, I'm just wondering, God, did... Did I take a courtesy fall for him? Did I, is this real? Like, what happened here? I mean, because I want it to be real, don't you? Yeah. But sometimes your analysis can get in the way. It, it was hindering. What I tell people now is, listen, analyze it tomorrow. Just go with it today. It's, it's so much like love. You know, the minute you start analyzing love, uh, you're going to mess it up. Imagine if I came home, Carol gives me a big kiss, and I said to her, ooh, what are you doing, putting your mouth on my mouth? <laughs> Don't you know how many germs there are in a person's mouth? <laughs> what would happen to the moment? <laughs> See, with the Lord, you got to go with it. Anyway, I'm there on the floor thinking, ah, oh, God. And so I kind of got up on one knee, and I'm sitting there with my hands up. And bless him, he wheeled around to me. He says, do you want it? I said politely, yes, I want it. Inside, I'm thinking, why do you think I've flown thousands of miles, spent thousands of dollars? <laughs> Yes, I want it. Then he said words that changed my life, friends. He said, then take it. And I'm like, what? Take it? I didn't know the Holy Spirit was there for the taking. I thought that, you know, you just had to passively position yourself and hope for the best, right? And with any luck, he'll fall on you. I didn't know you had to take it. Now, what I mean by that is there needs to be something in your heart that wants him and reaches out for him as well. <clears throat> for example, 
Jesus is looking for a bride that really loves him. Not someone who wants to marry him for his stuff and his money and his power and his blessing and, you know, somebody who really, really loves him. Is that you? Yes. You know, um, the day came when I thought to myself, I'm going to ask Carol if she'll marry me. And I'm not sure what she's going to say. But we drove out to a nice park, you know, in the Kitchener area, not far from where she lives. And finally I said to her, Carol, will you marry me? Now I was expecting her to say, well, we got a lot to think about. <laughs> After all, you have two girls, I have two boys, we have no money, da 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 da, we got a new business, da da da. But that's not what she said. She, do you want to know what she said? Yes. She said, oh, yes! <laughs> and I, it just floored me. And I'm saying, but, but, but wait a minute. We, you know, we, we, <laughs> we got a lot to think about. <laughs> oh, God will take care of all that. Yeah, but, uh, oh, God will take care of all that. I'm like, okay, if you're up for it, then let's do it. But see, that, that taught me what the Holy Spirit is looking for in you and me. When he comes along and says, would you like to be filled with my presence, power, and love so you can be a kingdom person and, and we, can, we can draw closer and prepare you for the marriage uh, that's coming and meanwhile you can begin bringing the kingdom and serving the Lord like never before. Amen. And many of us are like, well, we've got a lot to think about, haven't we? <laughs> you know, that's just kind of, eh, you're not the one. And so when he meets someone who's hungry and thirsty for this, there's something irresistible about that. Claudio said to me, do you want it? And I said, yes, I want it. But I was still in that passive mode until he said, then take it. And the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, I've been trying to give this to you for years. Will you take it, man? And I'm like, all right, I'm having it then. And boom, into my heart, there's this click of reality, like, I've got it. Something just happened to me here. And we, we knew something had happened, both of us. I mean, Carol, obviously, but now I know. And we came home from that. I met a vineyard friend who told me about Randy Clark, who'd had a similar impartation from Rodney Howard Brown. And I called Randy, who I knew him casually. And I said, Randy, I want you to come. And he's very hesitant, very tentative, too. He's saying, well, gosh, John, you know, uh, it only happened once, and uh, maybe it won't happen again. I said, well, come on anyway, and we'll, we'll see what God does. And so, right. That was November 93. Randy came. The first night was Thursday night, January 20th, 1994. Everything starts off like normal. Not a big crowd, 120, 130 people on a Thursday night. And Randy gave a testimony about how the Lord had brought him out of depression by the power of the Holy Spirit. And at the end of his story, everything's normal, normal, normal up to this point. You understand? Nobody laughed. Nobody shook. Nobody made a sound. They're all just attentive. And he said, if you'd like me to pray for you, then please come up to the front and I'll pray for you. And there's a slight hesitation. People are like, yeah, I, I think I'm going to go up and get them to pray for me. And as they went to get up out of their seats, 
it was like a bomb went off in the room, friends. And I'd never seen anything like that before, where all of a sudden the Holy Spirit fell. And the room explodes into bedlam. And they're screaming and laughing and shouting and falling and rolling and, and oh my gosh. And, and I'm up at the front there going, what is going on here? I'm used to people falling maybe one at a time. You know how Benny does it? One at a time, get them up and do the next one? Usually, until he prays for the, you know. But uh, I've never seen it spontaneous like that where nobody did anything other than he just crashed in on the room. And our, uh, one of our other pastors, Mary Audrey Raycroft, she's teaching in an adjoining room, and she hears all the noise. And it's going on and on and on and on. And she can't take it anymore. She said, what are they doing over there? So she came in the side door, expecting to see it, the, a room of people with their hands in the air, and they're being coached from the front, saying, come on, shout to the Lord, cheer, whatever. And her first thought is, where is everybody? <laughs> she hears this row, where are the people? They're under the chairs. They're between the rows. They're in the aisles. And then it hit her, and her mouth fell open, and bam, on her face. And she's there for 40 minutes. And when she got up, she could not speak, which was the second miracle that night. <laughs> she, she can talk, you know. And so we're away, and we're like, well, come on back tomorrow and bring some friends, everybody. And boy, they did. The same thing happened. The Holy Spirit just turned up sovereignly. By the end of that night, uh, Friday night, I turned to Randy and said, Randy, you're not going home. You can't go home. This is a move of God. God is just taken over the place. We're going to call your wife and see if you can stay for a while. So we've got Saturday, Sunday, and Deanne says, all right, he can stay two more days. Great. We're going Monday night and Tuesday night, everybody. Come on back. Then we got into Monday night. Same thing. I said, Randy, you can't go home. We've got to call Deanne back. This is just God. And so she says, all right, he can stay Wednesday and Thursday, but that's it. <laughs> He's coming home. We got four little kids. Ugh. All right. We did Thursday night, and Randy flew home Friday. And people are like, are we going to have a meeting uh, on Friday night? Yes, we are. Carol and I will be here, and the Holy Spirit will be here. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> and he sure enough was. And then we began to notice something. This was so contagious. You get around it for three or four days, and the next thing you know, when you go home, it's going to fall on your church. And that was an amazing thing to me. See, Claudio Friesen, when he was prayed for by Benny in Atlanta, he, he went home uh, filled and blessed, and he's telling his church about how the great crowd was there and, and the Holy Spirit moved, and he gestures like that, and a whole bunch of people fall down over on that side, and he's like, And then he keeps talking, and we're like, what is going on? See, it's contagious, this Holy Spirit. 
This is what we're working with, friends. Please don't ever get used to it. You know, we've taken heat because we honored the presence of the Holy Spirit. I don't even pay any attention to it. To me, it's a very small price for what we've received. Don't let anyone make you ashamed because of what happens when the Holy Spirit comes on you. See, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, it's, uh, there's something about them that's debilitating. Do you know what I mean by that? I mean, you just don't carry on like normal. There's, everything starts to slow down. And it appears to be drunkenness or whatever. And people were laughing, shaking, falling. I mean, some of the stories were just a riot. I had a guy that was a soloist for a famous evangelist. He came. And he's telling me his story. He said, John, I've got to tell you this story because this happened to me. He said, uh, I went <clears throat> to the back. I got prayer like everyone else. But after a while, I got up and I went into the bookstore. And I'm looking through all the stuff and this and that. But people started saying to me, are you okay? Can I help you? And so the first three or four times, I'm like, no, I'm fine. Thank you very much. I'm fine. But he said, by the sixth, seven, eighth time, I'm like, well, you leave me alone. What's the matter with you people? I keep telling you I'm fine. And they're like, eh, okay, okay. He said, it wasn't until my ride came to pick me up at the door that I realized I'd been walking around that whole time on my knees. <laughs> <clears throat> so I said, well, didn't it occur to you that you were, you know, shorter than everybody else? He said, no, it ne never occurred to me. And so now we're left with the question, well, why would God do that? I don't know. I suspect... He took him back to the time when he was a little boy and he was healing something deep within, I suspect. Could have been. But that's the kind of stuff that went on routinely. We were with friends last night and uh, we got talking about, you know, everything's going along great. It's a laughing revival. Everyone's having a good time. Then all of a sudden they started roaring. <laughs> And the guy, his name is Mike, he said, I was one of those people. <laughs> I roared my head off for an hour. And I'm like, okay, so. Why would God do that? Anybody, anybody want, want the answer to that question? Anybody want the answer to that question? I don't know. <laughs> but I had a, um, a friend in Stratford named Jerry. He connected somebody. He said, did you realize that in 94, while all that was going on, there was one and a half million Jews going back to Israel. And he read the scripture with, the Lord will roar like a lion and though my people will return home and all that kind of stuff. So here's a prophetic act going on over here that nobody has any idea what it's all about, but it's activating something in the spirit on the other side. I mean, there's power in the Holy Spirit. There's power in the Holy Spirit. See, the natural man, mind, does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. Have you read that in 2 Corinthians? They are foolishness to him, Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. I'm telling you all this because we are very, very soon heading into a time 
that's going to be 10 times or more what it was in the 90s, all right? And if what we had back there uh, scares you and, and it's just too bizarre for you, then you better run now. <laughs> because it's really going to get fun. But see, I love this stuff. I know what boring church is like. I remember. And then I was trying to grow one. I mean, you know, we had some stuff going on, but it was never, it was always hard work. It was never fun, really. And these people, you could choke them, you know? And then the Holy Spirit would just get them under the power for an hour, and they'd, they'd get up happy. You know, right? So when you think about it, if the Holy Spirit is really going to come upon you in power and work you over for an hour or so, you know, we, we had a guy just two or three years ago, he, he came in, in the January conference, he was under the power for 12 hours. I would love one of those, I think. <laughs> anyway, if he works you over, what's he going to deposit in you? Who can tell me? What? Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, meekness, faithfulness, and self-control. I'm glad you said that. See, people got all bent out of shape. Go, oh, these people are mad. They're all out of control, for goodness sake. It cannot be God. Listen, self-control is, is an enabling by the Spirit given to you so you can control yourself. It was never intended for you to control the Holy Spirit. So... When he comes upon you, your best move is to yield. Just yield. See, normally when we go somewhere, I drive. Even in Carol's car. She'd rather ride in her car than my car. So I drive. And here we go. But now and then, I'll say to her, babe, I want to finish the message. I want to do some email, I want to answer some text, I want to this or that, you drive. So I move over and she drives. Now, Carol's actually a better driver than I am, believe it or not. She's never had a speeding ticket. Wow. She's never had a parking ticket. She's never had any kind of ticket. And um, me, on the other hand, <laughs> I've had one or two. You know how that works? So, when you move over and let the Holy Spirit drive, you actually now have a better driver. Amen. You're safer than ever. Amen. Even though it might be a wild ride. Right? He knows what he's doing. And so he'll take over your life. And people do this, just the most incredible things. And I fell in love with the manifestations because I quickly learned that they were prophetic symbolism generally of some sort. Mm -hmm. And so at first, power comes on you and you're just reacting to the power. You're shaking and shouting and whatever. That's 90, 95% of it. But it was the 5% or 10% that got, got us into all the trouble because it would, it would escalate from just the person's reaction to the Holy Spirit to now the Holy Spirit saying something through those manifestations of that individual. Are you with me? For example, we're in a meeting. The power falls, 
somebody jumps out of their chair and starts running around the room. Have you seen that? How many have done that? The front row. Come on. So I, I'm curious now. And I interviewed them. Excuse me, but I noticed you were, you know, running around the room. Uh, what was going on? I felt like my feet were on fire. Oh, well, okay, if your feet are on fire, then you're going to run around the room. Right? So what does it mean if God sets your feet on fire? You're going to go places. Well, duh. <laughs> you see, the kids get it, but, but the, the theologians are like, where's that in the Bible there? You know, they're struggling. And, and so we, we realize that many, many of those manifestations was God at work. And that's what I took all the heat for. And if we could have said, look, it was probably demonic. We're not on top of it like we should be. We're sorry, everybody. We didn't stop that. You know, give us a break. People would have calmed down. But I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure it's God. And so we're going to let this, let this go. Now, we didn't let everything go. Our ministry team was very discerning. But if we sensed it was God, we let it go. We had to learn that. Quench not the Holy Spirit. Amen. Quench the evil spirits, yes, but quench not the Holy Spirit. You see? And we have to learn all this stuff, friends, because we're going, we're going for round two very, very soon. How many are up for it? <laughs> I felt like I gave the first 10 or 15 years doing apologetics for the manifestations that went on, trying to talk people through so they didn't miss the blessing. Because, see, at the end of the day, I don't care whether you fell, shook, laughed, cried, ran around, or whatever you did. I don't even care about that. I wanted to know what happened in here. And you tell me that you got transformed by this loving father, the like of which you've never experienced in your life, I'm like, come on. This is it. This is, this is the promise. See, we had a sociologist named Margaret Paloma. She came uh, in the summer of 96. And I didn't know who she was. She was from the University of Akron, Ohio. And and she said, I want to do a survey on all these people of yours that are falling out under the power. And she's kind of a feisty little lady, too. And, and you know, I'm like, well, I don't know if I want you to do that or not. See, I didn't want a sociologist coming along, doing their little survey, and then telling me, oh, it's all just hype and, and uh, manipulation and all that kind of stuff. And... and uh, and give me that kind of an answer and publish it. I didn't, I didn't really want that. I knew it wasn't that, but I didn't know whether she knew that or not. Anyway, I finally said, okay, go ahead. She interviewed about 1,000 people, 989 actually, of all different ages, and men, women, young people, older people. And uh, what her survey found was this, 93% of those people said, when I was on the floor under the power, uh, I came away from that more in love with Jesus than I have ever been in my life. And the second highest, 87% said, I am more excited about telling my family and friends about Christ than I have ever been before. I thought, man, that's it. That's Matthew 22, 37 right there. Love the Lord with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. There it is. That's, that's all I need to know. That's amazing fruit. <laughs> Margaret is still a good friend, and God bless her for that survey. But you see, you have, to, you have to dig into that kind of stuff. 
But here we are now, 25 years down the road, and we've kind of, many of us at least, have settled all this stuff. This is God. And I'm satisfied that 98% of it was just totally pure. The Holy Spirit came in power and love and fell upon his people. And it revolutionized our church. I mean, the Toronto church is now 2,000, but we have five other churches around the city that, are, that were, were campuses originally and now are standalone churches. And um, globally, we have a whole network of churches, and there's other networks that have all spun off be, because of it. A few years ago, I had Gideon Chu came, who was the first guy to roar like a lion. And he came to thank me. He said, John, I want to thank you first and foremost, first of all, for not throwing me under the bus. Because you stood with me and said it was the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to tell you where the Holy Spirit has taken me, where the roaring has taken me, he said. And he shared about all the blessing and how he's impacting China right now and the, and the, the house churches there and on and on and on. It's just an amazing story. You see, it's not by might or power, friends, but by my spirit. Now, the promise is given in, uh, in Matthew chapter 3, where John the Baptist sees Jesus, and uh, he points him out. Uh, I am the one who baptized in water, but he is going to baptize you or immerse you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Matthew 3.11 I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you. He will immerse you in the Holy Spirit and fire. And it's going to cleanse you. His winnowing fan is his hand. He'll thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he'll burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. There's a serious side to it, isn't there? The lost are really lost, friends. You don't just automatically go to heaven when you die. You must be born again. See, the whole thing is not, it's a very, very important part of life. It's not just a little religious game that some people play as they go through life. This is deadly serious stuff. We have to win our families and friends to the Lord so that when their spirit comes out of their body into, into that spiritual realm, they will be able to say, Jesus Christ died for me and paid my debt. So, I've been saved. I've been walked. There's all kinds of stuff going through the church today about um, where no matter what you believe, it's all okay. You know, you hear people say, well, Islam, Christianity, it's all the same deal, really, same God, whatever. But you know, it's not true. It's actually very, very opposite. Uh, we have a God of love. You know, we have a bunch of Iranians in our Toronto church. There's about 30 of them. And I love these guys. They're, they're incredible. I, I had them, a couple of them as security guards for a conference about a year ago. And so they're, they're up at the front, you know, and I said, hey, I want you to meet our security here tonight. This and his, uh, Imran, and this and his, whatever his name was. And they're originally from Iran, and they're here as our security guards. Don't you feel safe? <laughs> Everybody had a good laugh. But anyway, they're dear people. And I said to them, listen, you guys, like a year ago, you were in Islam, now you're a Christian. I want you to tell me what the difference is. Can you tell me, like, 
what's the difference? I mean, do you feel different? Is there a difference? Like, what's going on? So they had a little talk among themselves, you know, in Farsi. And then they said, we know what it is. They said, now we have peace. Before, we had no peace. We were angry about everything. I said, man, that's transformation right there. How many have peace tonight? See, it's the prince of peace. That doesn't mean everything's perfect in the world around you. It just means that you have an abiding peace on the inside that it's all going to work out somehow. God is perfect in all his ways. Did you know that? How many knew that? How many are happy about that? What are the implications to you that God is perfect in all his ways? That gives you and me a very, very big problem. Because, see, he's unhappy when you hurt someone else. If I hurt Carol, not only does she not like it, but he doesn't like it. And if someone hurts you, not only do you not like it, he doesn't like it. And that's what we call sin, where people are either perpetrators or victims. And he is such a perfectionist, he wants to put every wrong right. But here's the part of the problem. We're very thin-skinned when we're the victim. And we're very thick-skinned when we're the perpetrator. And so some say, oh, you really hurt me when you said that and did that. And we're like, oh, get over it, for goodness sake. It wasn't that big a deal. But when that happens to you, oh, my goodness. I just want you to know how, how much that hurt. Well, God wants to put all this right. And so through our lives, we accumulate this mountain of debt called sin. And there's no way to repay it. So he came up with a plan. Jesus, I want you to become a man, go to the earth, demonstrate the Father's love to them, but then die in their place and pay off their debt with your life. Now see, it's the substitutionary death of Christ that paid the debt. And even this, people are trying to water down theologically. I want you to really understand it, friends. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would just believe in him would never perish but have everlasting life. So who but Jesus is worth the entire human race, and more than, more so. See? So you can't just be a good guy, a good teacher, or another prophet, or something. If it's going to work, he has to be God, the Son of God who came as a man. Because now, he's worth something. More than all of us put together. Right? Right? Would you agree that God is worth more than all of us put together? And see, a lot of people, they read, read the symbolism in the Old Testament. For example, the story of Abraham and Isaac. you got to get, get that story into your heart where uh, uh, Abraham has promised a son, and they get discouraged along the way that Sarah says, take my maid and have a son with her. Ishmael comes along. But then God says, no, he's 99 years old, and God comes along and says, this time next year, you're going to embrace a son. You know what? They both laughed. Abraham laughed and Sarah laughed. Do you know what they called the kid? Laughter. And so Isaac is born, and now he grows up, and he's the delight of their hearts. He grows and grows. He's at least 12 or 13 years old. And the Lord comes back and says, Abraham, I want you to take your son who you love, 
and offer him to me as a burnt sacrifice. And Abraham says, yes. How many have read this story? Hands up high. How many understood the story? Or you went, what the heck is going on here? You know, rabbis to this day, they don't want to teach that to their yeshiva students because they don't know what it means. And they think it's, it's, it's suggesting human sacrifice. But that's not what it's suggesting. So now, Abraham and Isaac set off with two of the servants. Do you think he told Sarah? No way. <laughs> Honey, we're going camping for a couple of days and we'll be back. <laughs> so off they go. Guess where? One of the mountains of Moriah. Do you know what the Moriah is? That's that ridge that runs through Jerusalem. Mount Moriah. Uh, Zion, the city of David, is there. Mount Moriah is where the Temple Mount, quotes, sits. And Mount Calvary is the highest peak, uh, the highest peak on the ridge, probably where he went, probably where uh, Jesus was later crucified. But anyway, Abraham and Isaac are going up the hill. Isaac's got the wood on his back, and Abraham's got the fire in his hand. And Isaac says, Father, we have the wood and we have the fire. Where's the lamb for the sacrifice? Oh, what do you think that did to his heart? He says, God will provide the lamb, my son. God will be the provided lamb. The Hebrew is obscure. It could be taken both ways. God will himself be the provided lamb almost. Anyway, they, they go up the hill. Isaac is at least 12, some say he might have been 30. Who do you think could run the fastest? The 13-year-old or the 113-year-old? But he doesn't run. They put the wood on the altar that they built, and then he climbs up on the wood. He's submitting to this thing. And Abraham's about to kill him with a knife, and the voice says, stop! I wanted to know if you'd really go through with it. And we think, God, that's really cruel, actually. What kind of a test is that? How many have wondered about this story? Yeah. Only four or five of you. Don't you people wonder when you read the scripture? Yeah. God, what the heck is this? Here's what I think. God is saying, I want to know if there's a man anywhere willing to do what I'm about to do with my son. Wow. Only in my son's case, there's no stopping it. He just went for it right to the end. And it's, it's, it's such a heavy, powerful event that happened. Because it wasn't that he just died, but he took your sin upon him. What were the implications of that? The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin, that we might be called the, the righteousness of God in him. Did you ever wonder why in that last moment Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How many have wondered about that? Think about this. He's God forsaken in his most desperate hour. They had never, ever been separated in all of eternity. All of eternity. And now... He's forsaken. Why? Because your sin and mine were placed on that broken body. And he who knew no sin literally became you and me, became sin. 
so that there could be a divine exchange and we could become the righteousness of God through him. And his body became sin. But interestingly, it never touched his blood. You see, crucifixion, as horrible as it is, essentially they bleed to death. Where all those hours through the whipping, through the crown of thorns, through the nails in his hands and feet, the blood is pouring out every time he struggles to breathe. It works that wound and more blood comes out for six hours. And he's at the point of passing out because there's no blood left. And at that critical moment, your sin and mine is placed upon him. And he says, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he dies that moment. But his blood had not been touched by that sin. It was poured out. And the book of Hebrews says the blood of Jesus cries better things than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel cried out for justice. My brother has killed me. Do something. The blood of Jesus cries better things. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. What a champion savior. Amen. You know it would be enough if he just saved us? If we, if we just had the opportunity to have our sins forgiven and to be, to be rescued and to be saved, I mean, that should satisfy all of us. Hey, you know, be content. Take it and go. But no, no. That, that's just the doorway in. That's just the beginning. Now, he wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Now that you've been washed, now that you have his holiness instead of your sinfulness by faith, the Holy Spirit wants to come and live in you. And Father, Son, and Holy Spirit want to come in and be at home in you. And they want to prepare you for eternity. And they want to prepare you to be the bride of Christ. You know, Jesus is not looking for a, a sinning, indifferent, lazy, no good wife. He wants a beautiful, pure, healed up, loving, forgiving, gracious, kind, full of the fruit of the Spirit, Kind of wife. So that's what's taken all the time. But that's where we're going, friends. We're on our journey to meet the Father. I sometimes tell it like the Cinderella story. We all like the Cinderella story. You know, they have it in every, every country. They have it in Germany and Norway and Sweden and England and Japan and everybody. Everyone knows about Cinderella. See, the Cinderella story is a, is a takeoff on the gospel. You know, Cinderella, this girl living a normal life, mother, father, everything's cool. Then the mother dies. Tragic. Father remarries. And okay, father's there. This, but, you know, Disney's version, she had two stepdaughters, two, 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 two girls of her own. But then the father dies. And so now Cinderella's kind of enslaved by the family, and all her money and house and property and everything is, is taken, and she's, she's just told, work. Shut up and work. We don't want to hear from you. Just do it. And, uh, but the day comes when the fairy godmother gives her a chance to go to the ball. So the fairy godmother, a.k.a. the Holy Spirit, he dresses her all up in a nice coach and glass slippers and the whole deal. She goes to the ball, and the prince falls in love with her. And But at midnight, she's going to, you know, everything's going to change back. So she runs away. And he takes that one slipper and goes through the whole kingdom looking for the girl who's 
foot fits. How many love the story? And he finds her finally, and the slipper fits perfectly, and he's like, ah, I found you, my love. And they ride off together into the sunset and live happily ever after. Isn't that fantastic? How many like that story? Well, see, we need another chapter, however. And here's why. Because Cinderella has learned to be a survivor. She's an orphan now. She's not loved. She's worked. And she does not know anymore how to give love or receive it. She's just been broken down in life. So once he finds her, we need another chapter where he brings her home to father's house in the palace and say, listen, uh, you're going to live here for a while and you're going to learn that you're not a slave girl, you're a princess. And you're going to learn that yeah, we want to know what you would like and we want to know what you think and what you care about. And she has to learn her new identity as a new creation in Christ. And as she stops being an orphan and becomes a daughter of the king, you know, after a while, now she's ready to be represented to Prince Charming. And now they can live happily ever after. Do you see the difference? That's the process that we're all going through. Our hearts need to be healed up of all of life's hurt, fear, shame, pain, anger, abuse, mistreatment, injustices, all that kind of stuff, to where we come out the other side as a son and daughter of the king. And now we're ready for her. It's just the best story ever. So, if you're here and... Uh, You've never committed your life to Jesus, or perhaps you once did, but you got hurt and disillusioned and fell away and mad at God and, God, where were you when I needed you and all that kind of stuff. You didn't realize that life is purpose-built for testing your heart and motives. And just like Joseph in his dungeon, uh, your, your heart gets tested to see if you will still love him. All right? It's not that God does it or causes it, but when stuff happens, he wants to know, do you respond properly? And I feel like there's people in here who've gotten so hurt, they're mad at God. Listen, it wasn't him who did it. It was the enemy through someone else. It may be that you've never heard the gospel before, that Jesus came to rescue you, to, for, to pay the debt of your sin because you cannot die and have an outstanding debt on your hands or you will pay it yourself. Far better to let the Son of God pay it willingly so you can go free. Let's all stand for a moment. Lord, I ask you to come and search hearts, and there may be one or two or three or even more who need to repent and come home tonight. Families are under such attack these days that you're working. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came and died in your place and paid your debt. And it kicks in the moment you believe in him and ask for forgiveness and ask him to be your savior. And no one can force you to do this. This is something that you have to choose to do of your own free will. But something inside of you says, I want this. So if you're here tonight and you need to commit your life or recommit your life to him. I want you to think about doing it right now in just a moment. See, people fall away because they get 
hurt or they get careless or they get foolish or they get carried away and influenced by friends or maybe they pursue a, a relationship that compromises them or an education that talks them out of their faith how foolish or a career whatever friends the greatest gift God could ever give you is the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, the Son. If you know in your heart of hearts that you need him to come and wash you and forgive you and bring you back home, I want you just to admit that to yourself right now. Just quietly to yourself, say, Lord, Lord, to that's me. I, I need you back in my life. I, I want to come home. I want my life with God. I want Jesus Christ in my life.